uh, next up, I'd like to introduce our next speaker, uh, Neeraj Bal, who will be presenting life cycle of vendor maintenances at Meta's backbone. Neeraj is a production network engineer at Meta and traveled from San Francisco Bay Area to join us today. This is the first time Neeraj is speaking at Nanoc, and it's a pleasure to have him speaking with us today. Welcome, Neeraj. Thank you. This is next. Yeah. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Neeraj Behel. I'm a production network engineer in the Backbone IP team at Meta. I'm here today to talk about how we do external network maintenances in our Backbone networks. For this talk, we will focus on maintenances that impact our optical infrastructure. There's a huge group of people in Meta that work on this space, and I'm merely the one representing our work. Let's go over the flow of the presentation. Uh, we'll start with an introduction to our backbone networks, which is the space in which these maintenances take place, to get a high level overview of how the networks look like. We'll then go over why we are doing this, which is our problem statement. The middle section of the presentation will talk about the services involved in this space, how they interact with each other, the issues observed, and some improvements we drove to address those issues. The last section of this uh, talk would be more of how we, as a networking industry, can collaborate, drive improvements, and possibly standardization in this space also. So let's get started. So this is like a one million foot view of Meta's backbone networks. Uh, given our reach and the amount of traffic we have, our networks are global, which means they are spread across the globe. Broadly, we have three types of networks on which these maintenances take place. The first network is a network which connects data center regions to each other. It carries data center to data center traffic. The next network is which connects remote sites, we call them POPs, to data center regions. And the third network is the internal one. It resides inside POPs, we call it as Edge. It has a CDN type of services. This is where we peer with the internet, and this is where this POP network connects to the backboard also. So, as we can see, we have different types of networks. Each of these networks is actually designed very differently. It has different thresholds. It runs different routing protocols, so totally different design. And I'll go over in the later part of the presentation how we accommodate for this and what challenges this brings. Additionally, the way our optical infrastructure is actually laid out, it's a shared resource. Quote, unquote, it's an SRLG, which means that one maintenance can impact different types of networks. Because, as we can say, our data center to data center and POP to data center networks have more long-haul connectivity. It is totally possible that a maintenance can impact both these networks, and it may be safe in one, but it may not be safe in the other network. And these are some use cases we have to deal with and I'll go over again how uh, we address those in the later part of the presentation. So let's talk about why we are doing this. The first reason is very obvious, but it's the most important driver for us. At our scale, we cannot have humans parsing these maintenances and scheduling them. We need to have services to do this. We have thousands of fiber capacity which connect these networks, and we rely on 100 vendors to make that possible. Lots of vendors, which results in lot of, lots of notifications and translates to a lot of planned maintenances in our network. Thus, we require automation. Secondly, we need to balance between these planned maintenances, the reality of a production network, which always has outages, and ensure that these maintenances, which are really important because, in a way, they improve the reliability of the network, can be completed timely without having any degraded performance to the traffic these networks serve. So there needs to be a sweet spot between availability and the safety of these operations. The third reason is kind of a combination of both of them, but the reason I've called it out separately is because at our scale, our services are at a very critical path. They directly interact with the production network, and we need to ensure that any bugs or any issues or any risks seen by these services are escalated appropriately and we don't witness it in production. Okay, so let's understand the services involved in this space. 
uh, how they interact with each other. And the way we'll do this is by going over an end-to-end -end flow of a maintenance, right from the time we get notified about it till the time it's complete. We will first start with a use case where an entire maintenance is completed without any risks highlighted by the services or any failures in the service, and the current state of the network can actually consume that maintenance without any problems. Before I get into this section, I'd like to establish some terminology which would be useful for the subsequent part of the presentation. When we say external maintenances and external vendors, we are talking about maintenances which are scheduled by vendors with which, say, Meta leases a capacity. And when I am talking about internal maintenances, these are maintenances which are scheduled by internal employees at Meta, such as a forklift or a migration. And the reason there is this distinguish, like I have distinguished it, is because typically we have more uh, ability on the reschedule of internal maintenances because we are scheduling them. Okay, so let's get started. I'll go through each box and I'll talk about the services in there. So here, this is basically the process where the vendor notifies us via email to the email address we provided them about the maintenance. It will uh, basically consist of info which is required to schedule a maintenance such as start time, end time, what is the impact, and what are the services which are impacted. Typically circuit IDs in this case. This will make it to a mailbox. We will have a service which is going to go through this mailbox. It will go through the emails of this mailbox and it will try to get the information required to schedule a maintenance. So start time, end time, it will get the external IDs, it will try to convert it into our internal structs to schedule it. It will then if it works, okay. It will then call uh, this particular piece which is maintenance orchestrator. Let's talk about this for a second because this is sort of the heart and soul of this entire flow uh, because it has a lot of responsibility. It plays a very pivotal role. It is responsible for the execution of the maintenance from the time it starts it to completing it. Every maintenance we perform, internal or external, actually goes through this orchestrator. And we'll talk about why that is important later, but what that means is this orchestrator has the view of the network. In a sense, it even has the future view of the network because it knows the maintenance which are going to be performed. Because of its critical functionality, it relies on some other services for certain functions, such as it will rely on safety checks to determine if a maintenance is safe to be performed in the network. Now we do different types of checks there, we'll talk about those, but broadly, is it safe to be performed in the future state or in the current state? It then will actually rely on another service, we are calling it traffic shifts, to actually move traffic away from the impacted circuits of this network. So this is where the differentiation of us using different networks comes into play, because if the maintenance is impacting a network which is, say, running an IGP, an ISIS network, the way we would like to move traffic away before the maintenance so that it's not impacted and it does not cause loss is by increasing the metric. But if this was a BGP network, we would have to change the routing policy accordingly to move traffic away. Once these checks are completed, it will start the maintenance and it will monitor the window. Now, before it actually closes the maintenance, it will again call these services. This time in a slightly different role, safety checks this time would actually play the role of like health checks. We want to make sure the capacity we are putting back in production is healthy. Some of the checks we do here are like, is the, is the circuit flapping? Is it down? Are the corresponding protocols which run through that circuit up? And next, we will rely on traffic shifts to put back the production config so that these circuits can be part of the network, of the production network, and start taking traffic. And when this entire flow is completed, the maintenance is marked as complete, and there is no escalations, and there is no human involvement. And when there is no human involvement, this is how our life looks like. But unfortunately, this is not how our life always looks like. So let's talk about some failure scenarios in this flow. And let's discuss how we address those, uh, keeping reliability in mind. So the first scenario we'll talk about is a failure in maintenance parsing. So as we can see, we 
do escalate to humans. But let's talk about why we do this. It is our desire to keep track of every maintenance which is happening in our network. This allows us to know of instances where a maintenance could cause more than the desired uh, impact and result in traffic loss or put a given portion of the network in risk. The more advanced notice we have about this, the faster we can actually address it and prepare for the risk or mitigate it. Few reasons we have seen or we regularly see this happen is when the parsing logic between the vendor changes. Like even within the vendor, we can actually say if the person which is sending the email has changed because their parsing logic changes. But changes in parsing logic is one. Another use case we have seen this happen is like we have onboarded a new vendor and there is no parsing logic currently in place for us. So we don't, our default parsing logic doesn't match. We don't have a custom logic for it. And so our maintenance parcel will fail safe and it will escalate it to the human. There are also some other cases where like circuit IDs don't make sense, the time zone is wrong. And because a lot of these are human generated, there are typos. So uh, these are some of the reasons why humans get involved and they are escalated. And based on the type of failure, the human will contact the vendor, they will work with them. A typical reason here would be, it's a new vendor, we will try to adopt them to a standard parsing logic we try to use, or we will work with them to add an internal parser in our maintenance parser system. Now, because in this flow, the maintenance parser did not call the orchestrator, that was because it broke, um, the human would have to go ahead and schedule the maintenance in the maintenance orchestrator. But for subsequent, uh, basically, maintenances from the same vendor, if the parser is updated, the flow will get automated and the maintenance parser will then call the maintenance orchestrator. So this is where the human will call the maintenance orchestrator, the maintenance will be updated, and the remainder of the life cycle will like continue uh, if there are no failures there. Okay, so let's talk about an other failure scenario. This time, let's focus on a failure scenario in one of the services which um, the maintenance orchestrator relies on. Let's talk about safety checks failing. So again, as like this diagram shows, we escalated to a human, and the reason is so that we are aware of what risk this is bringing. Because a failure and safety check is usually uh, a clear sign uh, that there is some risk to the network based on the checks we do. So a few reasons why we have safety checks failures are, one, we have overlapping maintenances at a given part of the network by different vendors, and this puts the network at risk or we have a maintenance which is scheduled and has a large scope, and that is not what we intended when we designed the network and we worked with the vendor on for their services. So in these cases, we will work, uh, we will escalate it to the human. Some other cases are the reality of the production network is that there will be outages, and a maintenance which is going to happen in the future along with existing outages can put a certain portion of the network in risk in which case we can prioritize attending to those maintenances uh, or those outages. So depending of, on the type of failure, let's say there were overlapping maintenances, and this is where like advanced detection helps us, uh, we can work with the vendor to see if it's possible to reschedule it. And then we would have mitigated the impact. Based on what the end result is and the type of failure is, the scope of that maintenance will now be updated with the maintenance orchestrator, so that it has an end-to-end -end view um, of this maintenance and the network. It will then start the maintenance window and the maintenance will be completed. Okay, let's go over some of the issues we have seen. So this one, we actually uh, walked through it in scenario one, but there is a lack of standardization across and within vendors. Uh, even the previous talk highlighted this we have actually, like I said, like vendors within themselves also have changes on the format because some of them use humans to uh, send out these notifications. And we need to address this. And as we can see, as we are keeping reliability in mind to make sure we are aware of these maintenances, this can cause a lot of noise. Secondly, how do we categorize what is safe, what is not safe? 
it's one thing to categorize it given the various different types of networks we have and ensure that it's working as expected, but we need to ensure our services can do this in an automated fashion in, in, instead of a human looking and deciding what is safe, what is not safe. The human should be getting the escalation as a last resort when the service does not know, but we need to have some policies around this. And third, having enough visibility into the future state because if we are aware of our network, getting into a possibly risky or having an unacceptable maintenance or some sort of uh, impact, we have enough time to work with the vendors to address it. Okay, let's talk about how we fix this. So first, um, this is where like the maintenance parser comes into the picture. We normalize some of the vendor formats. We have a standard formatting logic, which we parsing logic, which we try to onboard some vendors to. And if we can't, we write parsers for it and we try to match it. This gives us some success. A lot of times uh, we are able to parse it. We have a decent amount of success rate in automation scheduling the maintenance. But again, any changes there result in escalations. Okay, so as we have seen, those five blocks actually represent many services. That was a very abstracted view. Uh, and um, the entire space is pretty and convoluted to understand. However, plan maintenances, as we all know in this room, that they are uh, an expected feature of a network, of a production network, and should be a well understood uh, activity which any network uh, team or person can handle. The way we address this, is by uh, having a small set of folks work on it together, understand the end-to-end -end space, pick out some issues, drive improvements, which I'm talking about here, and then bring it to a stage where it becomes more acceptable and there is enough success that it can be actually worked on through a normal life cycle of a network. Thirdly, we define policies on what is safe versus what is not safe. And the way we did it is by taking two broad approaches, like we have one sort of checks which are simulation based. They run well-known algorithms like MaxFlow, uh, depending on the network, they we even use PCE or constraint shortest path first. And the next uh, type of checks are threshold based. This is our mechanism of defense in depth. If there is any failure in simulation or anywhere across the flow, we do have these safety checks. We call it cardinality. Basically, these checks are intended to not take down more capacity than we ever expect in the network. Say if a maintenance for whatever reason is trying to take down 20% of the network, that is not something we expect. And even if any simulation-based check allows it, it is something we would like to fail on and get manual intervention into. Okay, so this is the last section of my talk and um, I'd like to talk about how we together can drive some improvements and some efforts in place uh, in this uh, space. So when we were working on this uh, presentation and going through the process of getting accepted, we created a LinkedIn group to like facilitate us in conversation. And we have got some great um, attention there. A lot of people have joined that. Um, so let's uh, get together there and like work on standardizing this space and see what we can actually do. Let's try to find our one size fits all. Is APIs the right answer or is it standardizing email formatting? Uh, if, it, if APIs is the right answer, then how would small vendors which actually don't have, um, don't have sort of the ability to actually use APIs, uh, do their, uh, schedule their maintenances? There is an existing internet draft and uh, we have been speaking to some uh, people from the industry which were working on this, I can't take names, they are waiting for legal approval, but uh, they have had quite a lot of success here. There are also some vendors which are interested in it. We had some great conversations here at Nanog uh, and they were very, very much for the standardization. It seems to be a pain point. This existing standard, it's now expired, but nothing stops us from revisiting it and actually working towards standardization. Uh, in the previous talk, there was a question around this. We this particular standard uses iCalendar. It, it uses experimental headers within iCalendar. 
to send the notification. So it makes it easier to parse. Uh, and yes, uh, there is a W3C group which is working towards creating it a standard. Personally, I think what stops this from becoming a standard is mainly adoption. Like if we try to adopt it and we learn from it, and if it is not the right answer, maybe we can revisit it. But right now, I personally think it would be most useful if we adopt towards it and work together to see what success looks like here. With that being said, thank you. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.